Turn your copy of the Word of God to 1 Timothy chapter 3. We are moving forward in this series of messages and exposition of Paul's first letter to the young pastor, Timothy. We are calling this series House Rules. And we've been looking at several rules that God has given us here in His Word for how we ought to conduct ourselves, not only as followers of Christ, but how we ought to conduct ourselves together as the body of Christ, the family of God. Rule number five today I'm going to cover for us this morning is select godly leaders. Select godly leaders. When you think of the word leader, what comes to mind for you? Well, obvious, probably somebody who is guiding and directing perhaps a, a group of people or maybe an organization. We see leaders in all facets of life. You know, there's leaders in government. There are leaders in homes. There are leaders on jobs and at businesses and at civic organizations. There are leaders everywhere. I heard another pastor say one time, and when he said it, I thought he overstated it, but the older that I've got, I've come to learn that what he said really was true. He said to me one time, he said, you know, everything rises and falls on leadership. Take a look around in your life, in your home, at your job, in the community, in your neighborhood, where there is good leadership. Many times great things can happen, but where there is bad leadership, many times it's hard and it's challenging and it's frustrating. As it pertains to the house of God and to the people of God, God has appointed leaders. He has called folks for service and He has set them aside to work and to labor for His glory. And while we know it's God who ordains and while we know it's God who calls, you and I as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ in the church have an obligation before God to seek out and to recognize those whom God has set aside to be the godly leaders that He intends for us to have. And today what I want to do from the Word of God is show you in particular here in 1 Timothy, how Paul says there are pastors, there are deacons, and how all of us are serving the risen Lord Jesus Christ. So let me read for us here the Word of God. 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. If you're glad to be here, say amen. amen. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. And likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderous, temperate, faithful in all things. And let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their houses well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, Timothy, these things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, that God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. What a powerful portion of the Word of God. Several things I want to say to you about it today. Number one, let's start with the pastors. Let me talk to you now about the qualifications of a pastor 
Verse 1 says there, this is a faithful saying that if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. In the New Testament, terms that are used for pastor, they might be bishop, might be called elder, might be called pastor, might be called shepherd. There are a number of titles, but they're all talking about the same office. When you and I do an examination of the Greek language in the New Testament, what we find is that there are primarily three words that are used for the office of pastor. The first of them is presbyteros, from which the Presbyterians borrow that term for the name of their denomination, Presbyterians. Presbyteros, typically in our English translations, that is translated as elder. Elder. It speaks of the integrity of the wisdom of the man who is to be holding the office of pastor, how he should be setting an example, as it were, to the flock. He's the elder. A second word in the Greek language, episkopos, literally when it's translated from the Greek, means overseer. That this person, this example, this elder is to be the overseer of the church's ministry and of the church's mission, seeing it fulfilled for the glory of God. Another term used for pastor in the Greek New Testament is poimain. This might be our favorite of all because poimain means shepherd. So that is to say then that God has called the pastor to lead the flock towards holiness, to protect them from predators who would come in from the outside and deceive the flock, and to feed them a steady diet of the Word of God. And in fact, if you wonder why do we use the word pastor, we get our English word pastor from a Latin word, pastor, which means literally pasture. All that to say that a pastor is a man of the flock. He is a leader of God's sheep, God's people. So the pastor is to be an example. He is to be an overseer. And he's also to be a shepherd. Now, who is qualified to serve in the capacity as pastor? If we're being totally honest about it, we would have to say today that no one really in and of themselves is qualified. The only qualification we have is granted to us by God, that God in His grace has allowed us as sinful men to be able to lead the people of God. Let me explain. Because when you look at the qualifications there, what does the Apostle Paul say? Number one, he says that a pastor is to be blameless. Blameless. Now, the, I, I kind of prefer, I think, the NIV translation here a little better, which says above reproach, because unfortunately, I think that the word blameless can communicate to us sinless. The problem we're going to have in trying to find a sinless pastor is that none are going to be available. The fact is, every pastor is a sinner saved only by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the fact of the matter is, there was only one sinless shepherd. And that was Jesus Christ himself. He is the chief shepherd, and all of us are serving under the Lord Jesus Christ. The word here in the original language means not to be apprehended, not to be taken hold of. What that means is, I believe, if that... This pastor is living blameless if, if he's living above reproach. An accusation, something could be leveled or hurled against him. Some form of ungodliness or whatever it may be. But if he's living for the Lord, if he's living above reproach, those accusations hurled at him will not be able to stick because he's a blameless man. He's a man who's above reproach in his living. Also, the scripture says here that he is to be the husband of one wife. Literally, when you translate that from the Greek, it means to be a one-woman man. Now, people have debated this over the course of time, and they've said, well, that's just an injunction or a prohibition of polygamy. A pastor is not to have more than one wife. Well, I think certainly it means that, but I think it means more than that. When you and I read the Scripture, God intends for us as men and women of God to be faithful to our spouses. So I think in this sense what it means is if a man is a husband of one wife, it's that he is faithful, endearing to the wife of his youth. He is a one-woman man. It's not just a prohibition of polygamy. The husband of one wife. And notice here also the Scripture says that a pastor is to be temperate. When we think of temperance, we think of alcohol. And that certainly could be in, you know, understated here, but I guess what, it's, what it means here is that the pastor is not intoxicated. He is a clear-thinking, wise man who does not allow himself to get overrun by ungodly forces that might be around him. 
And to that end, the Apostle Paul says here also that a pastor is to be sober-minded. That is to say, he is a man of self-control who has learned how to bring into submission to Christ the sensual desires, the fleshly desires that he may have. Scripture says also that the pastor is to be a man of good behavior. Now, what does that mean? I think that means that a pastor is to be a respectable man, one who exhibits a good witness, something that others can emulate and follow, much like the Apostle Paul said, imitate me, even as I also imitate Christ. That should be the desire of every pastor. Also, the pastor is to be hospitable, Paul says here. That is to say he is a man who is generous and gracious, even to strangers. A pastor, a minister should be the sort of man that others can come around, and even if they don't know him, they ought to feel at home with him, like they're loved and like they are accepted. Also, the Scripture says here that a pastor is to be able to teach. Some translations say apt to teach. I take that to mean that if a man is not an effective preacher or teacher of the Scripture, he really has no business serving in the capacity as pastor. Here's the truth of the matter. God has gifted all of us in the body of Christ. Every single person I'm looking at, child of God, if you're born again, you have been gifted by the Holy Spirit with what the Bible calls in the New Testament spiritual gifts. Some are given the gift of hospitality. Some are given the gift of mercy. Some are given a gift of administration. Some are giving a gift of teaching, prophecy, instruction. There's a variety of gifts. And what we're saying is that not everybody has been gifted the same way. But if God has called a man, if God has set aside a man to be a pastor, to be a man that feeds the flock, then he must be able to teach. That's what Paul's saying. And then what else does it say here about the pastor? It says he's not to be given to wine. Not given to wine. You know, there's some difference of opinion about this. We Baptists, over the course of time, our pastors, we have been known as abstaining from alcohol, not using alcohol. If you were to talk to leaders, pastors of other denominations, they might have a different view about that. Scripture says here that a pastor is not to be given to wine. Not to be a user of wine is the way that I understand that. Personally, I abstain from the use of alcohol. I know that there are other men who say that they are men of God, say that they've been set apart for the work of God, and they may drink. That's between them and the Lord. But as for myself, the way that I feel about it is that if I am being filled with the Holy Spirit, I will not need to go seek the spirits from the package store. Are y'all with me on that? I encourage you in that as well. Do you know John the Baptist and Timothy did not drink alcohol. And in fact, Paul, in, at the end of this book in 1 Timothy chapter 5, had to say to Timothy, Timothy, take a little wine for what ails you. You know why? Because he was abstaining from the use of alcohol, but he was sick, and they did not have these 21st century modern medicine uh, enhancements and improvements available to them. And so they had to use whatever was at their disposal. And so in the case of Timothy, he had to use the wine for a medicinal purpose. But beloved, I'm going to say to you in this day and time, well, we've got clean drinking water running from the taps in our home. And we've got a variety of other drinking options. We need to choose something else other than alcohol. Let me say this to you. Some of you all had dads or moms or people in your life who abused alcohol. What did that do to you? What did that do to your family? You know every alcoholic began with their first drink? I've already got enough to battle against personally. I don't know if you feel the same way, but I've got enough spiritual battle going on. I don't need to add something else to the battle. Let's just abstain from it. I believe pastors should be a man who stays away from the alcohol. Scripture says here also that a pastor is not to be violent. He is to be gentle. He is not to be quarrelsome. That is to say, he's not a combative man. He's truly a gentle man, a gentleman. And others should, should feel that and see that. Scripture says here also in the passage, Paul says that a pastor is not greedy for money. That means literally, translated literally, that he is not a lover of money. 
Some have inappropriately quoted a verse of Scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 6 here at the end of the book where they say that money is the root of all evil. Maybe you've heard that before. Maybe you believe that. That's not what the Scripture says. Scripture says in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that the love of money is the root of all forms of evil. You know why? It's because if you're such a great lover of money, that money, that love of money can replace your love of God. What did Jesus say in the Gospels? He said, a man must choose whom his master is going to be. You cannot have two masters. Either you will love the one, hate the other, vice versa. A man cannot serve both God and Jesus said, mammon, in our vernacular, we would say money. If you have money, that's fine. You've got money in your bank account, that's fine. You've got a nice home, you've got nice cars. There's nothing sinful about any of that. But listen to me. When that money becomes the most important thing in your life, you are a lover of money rather than a lover of God. Be careful about that. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all forms of evil. Make sure that your money is in the appropriate perspective and priority in your life. Also, the Scripture says here that a pastor is not to be covetous. That is to say he's not a jealous man. He is a man of godly contentment. In that same passage I was just quoting to you in 1 Timothy chapter 6, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all forms of evil. Four verses prior to that, Scripture says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Isn't it wonderful when you're not so desiring for something else all the time and you're simply blessed and thankful for what God has already blessed you with? And in the midst of that, you live godly before the Lord? I'm just telling you, 1 Timothy 6, 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Scripture says here also that a pastor is one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? What are we to make of this? What I make of it is that a pastor is a man who manages the affairs of his own home leading his wife, leading his children in paths of righteousness so that they would move forward and bear fruit themselves for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will tell you this about pastors too, that a pastor's first ministry, his ministry must begin in his home with his wife, with his children. Do you know I have witnessed men who have sacrificed their own families on the altar of ministry? It ought not to be that way. A pastor is a man of God who loves his wife and loves his children and ministers and makes sure that their needs are provided for and leads them in paths of righteousness for the glory of God. I would go so far as to say that if a man is not a faithful husband, If he's not a faithful, godly father, he's not qualified biblically to serve the body of Christ. Ministry begins first in the home, according to the Scripture. And look at this. Paul says also that a pastor is not a novice. Lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation As the devil. And what was the condemnation that the devil fell into? He thought that he could be as great as God. He found out different when he was banished from heaven and sentenced to hell. All that to say that a pastor is not to be a new believer. He is a man who has proved himself a faithful man in service to the body of Christ. Paul says here also that a pastor must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into the reproach and the snare of the devil. I take that to mean that a pastor is to be a man who is in the world, engaging the world with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But while he be in the world, he's not of the world. He's not overrun with the ungodliness and the unholiness that the world affords. I've given you several things here that Paul says in this chapter, 1 Timothy, about pastors. Did you know, though, that this is not a comprehensive list? 
that there are some other things that Paul says to another young pastor named Titus. Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, there's just a few things there that are left out in Paul's list here in 1 Timothy 3. He says in Titus 1 that a pastor is to be, uh, do his work as a steward of God, not a self-willed man. In other words, a pastor will not make it if he is motivated by anything other than the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're motivated by something else, if you're motivated by self, it won't happen. Scripture says here that a pastor is not to be quick-tempered. He is to be patient. He is to be long-suffering, realizing that God has forgiven him much greater than anything he'll ever have to forgive anybody else. Not quick-tempered, long-suffering. Scripture says here that a pastor is to be a, a lover of what is good. I like that. A lover of what is good in Titus 1. A pastor is to be a man who is excellent at what is good, the Bible says in Romans 16. Innocent of those things that are evil. A lover of what God loves. Scripture says in Titus 1 that a pastor is to be just and he is to be holy. I take that to mean that a pastor is a man who is fair towards everyone. And he's godly. He's impartial. Finally, Paul says to Titus in Titus 1 that a pastor is holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. I take all that to mean that a pastor is a man who does not compromise the truth of Scripture in order to make it more palatable to the modern mindset. Let me fill you in on something. An exclusive gospel saying that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life, and that those who refuse to place their faith in Christ will spend their eternity in hell, that is an offense to our culture. And so you know what people have done? They've changed that message. They've amended it. They've altered it a little bit. Rather than giving people the truth, we give them cotton candy. Let me ask you, parents, if your children wanted to make their diet three meals a day every day of their life, cotton candy, would you let them do it? You wouldn't. You know why? Because it will be terrible for their bodies. It will stunt their growth. It will rot their teeth. We, we, have, we have turned the gospel into some sort of fluff that's not even scriptural anymore. We need the truth of the Word of God, and a man of God, a true pastor, is a man who will preach the whole counsel of God, say, thus saith the Lord. And if there's a problem with that, the problem is not with the pastor. The problem is with the Lord. And that's what we've got to reconcile before God. A pastor is a man who can challenge false teachers with the truth, sometimes even publicly. Pastors have to rebuke those that are speaking in error, lest the sheep, the flock of God, be misled and be caught up in that deception. If you are counting in those qualifications that I just gave you, there are no less than 20 different qualifications that the Apostle Paul has given here for a man to be a pastor, a man of God. All that to say that pastors need your prayers. And by the way, the most important thing that you can do for a pastor is to pray for him. It's the most important thing you can do because pastors are always in the crosshairs of the devil and he's looking for a way. What does the scripture say? I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. The devil wants to attack pastors. They need your prayers. You say, well, I would, but I don't like my pastor. <laughs> I heard a man say one time, if you don't have the pastor you want, pray for the pastor you have. And maybe God will do something inside of him. Number two. That's the qualifications of a pastor. Let me talk to you now about the qualifications of a deacon. Let's give these pastors a break for just a second. Let's talk about those deacons for a while. Isn't it interesting, by the way, I went to Southeastern Seminary, Southern Baptist, you, Southern Baptist, bought 
1950 or 1951, you bought the old Wake Forest University campus and now it is a Bible-believing Pastor equipping seminary in Wake Forest, North Carolina. So you've heard of Wake Forest University. Well, this is kind of confusing, but Wake Forest University is not in Wake Forest. Now it's in Winston-Salem. That's confusing. I don't know why they didn't change the name when they moved it, but they didn't. Here's what's interesting, though. A Baptist school, Wake Forest University, guess what they chose as their mascot? Demon deacons. I'm just going to leave that right there. <laughs> oh my. Verses 8 through 13 is where we find out about it here. Look what Paul says here. Those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. So what in the world is a deacon? Is a deacon just a man who's won a popularity contest? And now we've given him some sort of honorary title or is it somebody that we outfit to be a board of directors for the body of Christ? Is that what a deacon is? You know the word deacon, what we translate as deacon in our copies of the Word of God is the Greek diakonos. Diakonos is two Greek words that are pushed together. And what those words mean literally is through the dust. A diakonos in the ancient world was a servant. A person who served from table to table, house to house, place to place, person to person, and as they went in their service, I think the reason they were given the name Diakonos is because they kicked up the dust as they served from place to place and person to person. So what I'm saying to you is that a deacon is not a director. A deacon is a servant called by God, commissioned to serve the needs of the body of Christ. And I thank God that in this church we've got many godly deacons who love the church and who love widows and serve the needs of our congregation. It's wonderful. Now, who has been called to serve as a deacon? Well, the Bible gives us here several qualifications. First of all, those that are reverent, that is to say men who are holy, men who fear the Lord, and so they don't fear men. Y'all with me out there? Listen to me. If you fear the Lord, you won't fear other people. Think about that, pray about that, because I can tell that's not sinking in yet. It'll sink in maybe about lunchtime if you pray on that a little bit. <coughs> Scripture says here a deacon is not to be double-tongued. In other words, a deacon is to be a man, men who say what they mean and they mean what they say. Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your, your no, no. All this double-mindedness, all these fake agreements and this fine print that we have in the world, it's not godly. Say what you mean, mean what you say. Scripture says here, some deacons are going to say, man, see, look, I, we've got something here. Not given to much wine. Now, about the pastors, it said not given to wine. Isn't that what it said? But on the deacons now, see, God threw in an extra word right there. Not given to much wine. Different from the qualifications given for pastors. Some have used this over the course of time to say, see there, pastor, you can't touch the alcohol, but we can have a little bit. See, that's that demon deacons thing I was talking to you about earlier, right? <laughs> now, I've never had a deacon say that to me before ever in any church I've ever served. But some as they have been translating or interpreting the word of God, they've said, well, it looks like that, that God has given a, a softer commitment in regard to alcohol for a, for a deacon. Well, here's what I know for a fact. Here's what we can say biblically. Clearly, this is a prohibition of drunkenness. But lest a deacon or a man be led to think, oh, that means that I can drink socially or recreationally. I think that we've got to contend with the rest of Scripture before we take that approach. I asked, I asked the 8 o'clock crowd, I said, I know you guys won't be here until lunchtime, but let's say you were, like you guys are. Let's say after this is over, I decide, I take my wife and my children, we go down to a restaurant here somewhere, and I walk up to the bar and I say, hey, can you serve me a cold one? I preached twice this morning. I need something to take the edge off a little bit. <laughs> serve me some alcohol. If you walked in and you saw me sitting there at that bar, you'd think, he's not a man of God. What's he doing over there? He doesn't need to be over there. Now, that's, that's the standard we would have for a pastor, right? What about as it pertains to a deacon? 
We say, well, the scripture says he's not to be given to much wine, so it's okay for him to be over there and to have a drink or two. Consider the fact that you and I, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have a witness before God. There's something that we are communicating to lost people about God and about the Christ that we serve. Here's my concern. If I go belly up at a bar somewhere, what that might be communicating to others that don't know Jesus is that the Holy Spirit is not enough for that man. See, he needs these other spirits that they're serving at the bar in order to make it work and to live for Christ. I would just encourage every man, every woman, by the way, to carefully consider never picking up the alcohol I don't think that this, this passage, this clause here is an automatic permission for social or recreational drinking. We have to be so careful not to give the devil a foothold in our lives. Scripture says here a deacon is not to be greedy for money. So we're talking about men for whom gold is not their God. We're talking about men who are driven more by heavenly riches than they are by earthly riches. And boy, there's a big difference, isn't there? Didn't Jesus say, lay up for yourself treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves cannot break in and steal? Scripture says here also that deacons are to be holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. Here's the best way I can explain this one. We're talking about men who were fully convinced of the gospel of grace as they live out the grace of the gospel. Let me say that one more time. Men who are fully convinced of the gospel of grace while at the same time living out the grace of the gospel. That's what we're talking about with deacons. Also the scripture says here, but let these also be first tested, then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. So we're talking about men who have proven themselves to be above reproach upon examination by a local church. You know, we don't just flippantly say one day as a church, okay, this man's a deacon now. It comes after examination. It comes with ordination and setting aside when men have proved that by their conduct they are men of God. Scripture also says here that deacons likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanders, temperate, faithful in all things. So even the wife of a deacon, given some qualification here, and the Scripture says that she must be reverent. That is to say, she must be a holy woman of God. And that she's not to be a slander. That's to say, she's not to be a gossip. She's not to be a talebearer. She's not to be a carrier along of strife and division. She's to be temperate. That is to say, she is to be self-controlled in the way she conducts herself. And Paul says here that this, this lady, this wife of a deacon is to be faithful in all things. I would take that to mean, first of all, to God, to her husband, to her children, to her church, to the kingdom of God. And deacons, let me say to you that the Scripture says that deacons are to be the husbands of one wife ruling their children and their own houses well. The same standard for the home being given to deacons just as it was to pastors. Let me say to you also today that in addition to these, we find just a few others in Acts chapter 6. Listen to this. The Bible says there the first deacons that were called out for service, first of all, that they were men of good reputation. Men who are known to be holy men of God and their reputation for holiness and godliness goes before them. And as I've already alluded to in talking about alcohol, we're talking about men that are full of the Holy Spirit. Listen to me. Faithful deacons, men that are qualified to serve in that capacity are men who are not only sealed by the Holy Spirit, and what do I mean by that? The Bible says that when you came to faith in Christ, sir or ma'am, you were sealed by God himself until the day of redemption. What does that mean? God put his mark on you. And you were known to God as a child of God because he has sealed you with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit inhabited you, sealed you when you placed your faith in Jesus. Now it's one thing for a man or for a woman to be sealed by the Holy Spirit, set aside for the day, of salvation and redemption, it's another thing 
for a man, for a woman to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, since we've been talking a little bit about alcohol this morning, you know, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, Be not filled with wine, wherein is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. A deacon is a man who through prayer and Bible study and service and evangelism is a man that is filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Scripture says here also that a deacon is to be a man full of wisdom. Men who know the Word of God and then take that Word and apply it to their own lives. And then one final requirement we see in the Word of God for a deacon is that he is to be a man who is full of faith. Men who trust in God. They're convinced of that gospel of grace we were talking about earlier. They have such great faith that they're even willing to lose their life for the cause of Christ. As with pastors, deacons need your prayers as they serve the needs of the local church. I encourage you today to understand what the service, what the call of God is for a deacon. Understand that. And then pray for them, encourage them, empower them as they seek to meet the needs of the local body of Christ. Don't expect them to do something that God has not called them to do. Let them serve in the capacity that God has called them to serve. Number three, let me say to you finally this morning, I want to talk to you now most importantly, not just about the qualifications of a pastor or of a deacon, I'm going to talk to you about the qualifications of a Savior. As listed here in the Word of God, in verse 15, Paul provides us the reason for his writing, explaining the context of the preceding verses. He says, Timothy, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar in the ground of truth. That's why we've given this message the title, House Rules. There's a way that God expects for you and I, as brothers and sisters in Christ, there's a way He expects us to conduct ourselves. In the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a shame sometimes that we don't think more about that expectation or hold one another accountable more to that expectation. It's been well said in the past that in some cases it seems like there's more expectation of a member of the key club or Kiwanis than there is of the church of the living God. No, there's expectations by God for how we should conduct ourselves. It's right here in the scripture. When we select godly leaders, when we pray for their ministry, when we allow them to do their work. We are actually strengthening the body of Christ. And everything we do, doesn't matter if we're a pastor, doesn't matter if it's a deacon, doesn't matter if it's a lay person, doesn't matter if it's a teacher or a committee member. Everything that we do inside the house of God is done as a result of the mystery of godliness. I preached on this passage not long ago, so I'm not going to elaborate too far, but I do want to remind you today of the glorious gospel of our Savior Christ, and it's listed right here in Timothy, 1 Timothy 3.16. You know John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is a wonderful, concise containment of the gospel, what it takes for a person to be saved. But if you want a more detailed account of what the gospel is, it's here in the other 3.16. In 1 Timothy 3.16, and look what Paul says about it here. He says that our Savior Christ, first of all, was manifested in the flesh. Isn't that what we just celebrated at Christmas? That the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ, though He was completely and fully God, at the incarnation being born to the Virgin Mary, He became completely and fully man. And I've got news for you. Colossians 2 says that all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily in Jesus Christ. The perfect Son of God. God was manifested in the flesh. And then also the Scripture says here that Christ was justified in the Spirit. Now what does that mean? Some 2,000 years ago, a little over 2,000 years ago, Christ was born. Christ Grew up just like a normal Jewish boy. Learned the trade of a carpenter in the home of Mary and of Joseph. Grew in wisdom and stature before God and men, the Bible says in Luke chapter 2. But then finally came to a time when he was about 30 years old, we believe, that Jesus went out to the Jordan River. And there was a man named John the Baptist. 
And he was clothed with camel's hair. He wore a leather belt around his waist. And his diet was locust and wild honey. And everybody probably thought he was a crazy man. He was a prophet of God. He was the forerunner of Christ. And Jesus came to John the Baptist at the Jordan River and said, John, I need to be baptized by you. And John said, Lord, I need to be baptized by you. I'm not even worthy to reach down and unloose your sandal strap. And you're coming to me? And Jesus said, let it be so. Now, for thus it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. And so the scripture says that John the Baptist permitted it. And John the Baptist baptized Jesus, plunged him down into the Jordan River. And as he came out, here's what the Word of God says. That the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, descended from the heavens downward and came and rested and alighted upon our Lord Jesus Christ like a dove. And when that happened, a voice rang out from the heavens. It was the voice of the heavenly Father. And the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And consider in that moment that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit were present at the baptism of Christ. And that was the Holy Spirit saying to every person that would ever live, Jesus is the Christ. He is the one who you've been waiting for. He's the one who's come to pay your sin debt. He was justified in the Spirit. And the Scripture says also that He was seen by angels. How is that? Well, if you read Colossians chapter 1, the Bible says everything that has been made was made by Christ. Everything came through Christ. Even the angels the creation of God, seen by angels throughout all of eternity past. But even during his ministry, Christ was witnessed by angels because remember from the cross, Jesus, he said, I could call down legions of angels to come and deliver me. These were angels who knew the power and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Scripture also says here that Jesus was preached among the Gentiles. And aren't you glad about that? Because as I look about the room today, I suspect there's probably not many Jewish people here. Now maybe you are. Maybe you're of Jewish lineage. And if so, we say praise the Lord. But probably for the majority of us, we are Gentiles. Aren't you glad that Christ was preached among the Gentiles by His followers? by Paul, by Peter, by Andrew, by James, by Luke, by all of them, going all over the ancient world and letting people know Jesus Christ is the Lord of glory. Jesus said in Matthew 24, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all of the world and then the Christ shall come. I think we're getting closer and closer to it every day. He was preached on in the world. And the scripture says here, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, the scripture says here, believed on. Aren't you glad that when you read the Revelation, the scripture says in Revelation that out of every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation, there is going to be assembled in heaven those who have been called to salvation and have been saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. All this racism stuff we worry with down here, all these problems that we have down here, all of that's going to be eradicated when we are worshiping at the feet of Jesus. Because they will be called from all places. And no matter their color, no matter their language, no matter their creed, every one of them made in the image of God. Worshiping at the feet of Jesus. Thank God Jesus has been believed on in the world. Here we are in the United States of America our forefathers didn't get here till the early 1600s. And yet the gospel has reached us. Every continent, every place, the Lord Jesus has been believed. And the scripture says here that he was received up into glory. After his glorious death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus rose from the dead early on the first day of the week, that Sunday, all those many years ago. And did you know that after his resurrection... Jesus presented himself alive to hundreds of people following his resurrection. After 40 days, Scripture says, he took his disciples up to the Mount of Olives. He was commanding them. He said, Ben, you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world, you're going to bear witness unto me. And the scripture says, while he was still talking, wouldn't you like to have been there? 
Jesus ascended upwards into the heavens. <laughs> and some angels standing with them, who they probably didn't notice until they started talking, said, men, why do you stand here gazing up into the heavens? This same Jesus who has been taken from you shall come back in like manner. But what I'm saying to you is that Jesus, when he ascended up into the heavens, took his place and sat down at the right hand of God. But one of these days, Jesus is going to stand up at just the right time. The Bible says a trumpet's going to blow. There'll be a shout from the heavens. Archangel will cry out. The dead in Christ are going to rise. We shall receive our judgment at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus is going to come back and establish his kingdom on this earth. Jesus is reigning as the Lord of glory today. I know it doesn't seem like that. I know it doesn't look like that when we look around the world. But I'm telling you, Jesus Christ is seated upon the throne of heaven. He is the sovereign Lord. He is in control. And what I'm saying to you is that everything we do in the body of Christ is about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about His Word. It's about His Spirit. It's about His power. It's about His gospel. It's about His mission. And more than anything else, it is about His glory. When the church begins to revolve around someone or something other than the Lord Jesus Christ, we have lost our way and we've ceased to operate as a church because Jesus is the head of the body of Christ. By virtue of his glorious resurrection, ascension, his victory over death, Jesus alone is worthy to receive our worship because he alone is qualified, beloved, to be our Savior, to be our mediator, and to be our Lord. I've told you what a leader is and what God says about leaders for the church. What is a church? What is a church? A church is an organization whose members are adopted by the Heavenly Father, indebted to Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, instructed by the Word of God, directed by pastors, served by deacons, and focused on discipleship. That's what we are. And that's what Christ saved us to be. God has appointed leaders for this church and for every true church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray for them. Help them. Love them. Roll up your sleeves. Stand alongside them and fight the good fight with them. And one of these days at the end of time, we'll hear our Lord Jesus Christ say, well done. Good and faithful servant. Just yesterday, in this room, we had the memorial service of Tim Hall. Some of you may have been here for that. Tim Hall got sick a few weeks ago. And within just days, he was gone. I got to see him before he passed away. I think it was a Monday. I got a call that he was not doing well at all. He was at Park West. I thought to myself, I don't know if they're going to let me in or not, but I'm going to go try. So I went down and went up to his room, and they did let me in. He had the machines on. He was, he was not feeling well. He was not in good health. None of us knew he only had hours, hours left to live. I was talking with him. I was praying with him. I shared Psalm 23 with him. And tears were rolling down his eyes. And I said, brother, I want you to know I love you. And I want you to know what you've meant to me. He said, Tim, I want you to know something. You have always been a friend to me. And I thank God for you. Tim Hall was a man who loved God, loved the Lord Jesus Christ. He loved the gospel. He loved missions. But he loved pastors. He loved leaders. I think men like him leave behind for us a wonderful legacy they left behind and what it means 
to love the Lord, to love the church, to love leaders, to love pastors. And one thing I can say about him was he led us on mission over and over and over again. He's going to be missed. We need others to step up and to take the mantle. Jesus said, pray, therefore, that the Lord of the harvest would send labors into the midst of his harvest. Is that you, sir or ma'am?